Hello and welcome. This is one of those videos that I wished I didn't have to make, but I feel compelled to make. I'm really concerned about the leadership style of Sir Keir Starmer. I know that at the time of recording this video, there's a lot of speculation about Sir Keir concerning donations and other things. In this video, I'm focusing on his leadership specifically. To do that, I'm going to be aided and abetted by some parts of Rosie Duffield's resignation letter from the Labour Party and an article about narcissistic leadership. To begin then with uh, Rosie Duffield's letter, although many last straws have led to my decision, my reason for leaving now is a programme of policies you seem determined to stick to. However unpopular they are with the electorate and your own MPs. You repeat often that you will make the tough decisions and that the country is all in this together. But those decisions do not directly affect any one of us in Parliament. Well said, Rosie. They are cruel and unnecessary and affect hundreds of thousands of our poorest, most vulnerable constituents. I went written like that. I mean, that's pretty stark, isn't it? Let's go on with uh, the letter. This is not what I was elected to do. It is not even wise politics. It certainly is not the politics of service. Absolutely not. And so many people in leadership positions, particularly politicians, need to remember they are there to serve, not to dictate. Let's go to this article then, how narcissistic leaders destroy from within. But in the last decade or so, there's been an outpouring of research in what's called grandiose narcissism. This is opposed to what's sometimes called vulnerable narcissism. These individuals have high self-esteem. They're much more agentic, meaning that they believe in themselves. They believe they can make a difference. They formulate a plan and they execute that plan. They do things, they have agency. They're more extroverted and really more dangerous. And evidence shows that they're achieving high positions in organizations, getting promoted and making more money than normal people. Then we go back to Rosie's letter. I did not vote for you to lead our party for reasons I won't describe in detail here, but. As someone elevated immediately to a shadow cabinet position, without following the usual path of honing your political skills on the back benches, you had very little previous political footprint. It was therefore unclear what your political passions, drive or direction might be as a leader of the Labour Party, a large movement of people united by a desire for social justice and support of those most in need. And then back to the article. If you're evaluating candidates for high office, you really need to look beyond the self-presentation. Too often when board select CEOs, especially outside CEOs from another company, for example, they do it through interviews. But interviews play to the strength of a narcissist. And you can't just look at performance because they can fake performance. So in other words, if you haven't had a sense of the track record of the CEO in position and done your homework and looked at what they've done in other organizations, then how can you tell? Because in an interview situation, AKA just presenting themselves to groups of people, maybe even socially, they can look really good. And the parallel I would draw here is that we had no real track record for Kia, or not much not as much. Then back to Rosie's letter. Your promotion of those with no proven political skills and no previous parliamentary experience, but who happen to be related to those close to you or even each other is frankly embarrassing. That certainly does sound embarrassing, doesn't it? But even worse, narcissists 
change the companies or countries they lead, much like bad money drives out good, and those changes can outlast their own tenure. O'Reilly says, divergent voices are silenced, flattery and servility are rewarded, and cynicism and apathy corrode any sense of shared purpose in a culture where everyone's out for themselves. In the extreme, they can destroy the institution itself. Ascending to a position of power only reinforces these tendencies. Being elected or appointed to office validates her sense of entitlement. At the same time, even without narcissism, power disinhibits. It encourages people to indulge their worst instincts. So now you've got the two working together. As a result, narcissists often feel they don't receive the admiration and credit they deserve, and they can seem pathologically consumed with resentment. That can take the form of petulance, aggression, unhinged public rants, and abuse of underlings. What I wanted to talk to him was about the bigger point. I didn't want to get into a row about tickets for football or whether he should claim uh, this flat and go and live there with his family. What I was trying to say is, do you understand how it looks when you present yourself as one thing and then you allow a perception to build that you're just like the others, uh, you're taking freebies. At one point I said to him, some people might think this is continuity junction, you're taking freebies from rich friends. He looked, he was absolutely furious with me. It was really uncomfortable, but I'm there to ask the questions. And I imagine that if the shoe had been on the other foot and this was a Conservative Prime Minister doing this and he was the leader of the opposition, he would have absolutely expected that person to face scrutiny and answer questions on it. It vexes me. I'm terribly vexed. Back to Rosie's letter. Someone with far above average wealth choosing to keep the Conservatives' two-child limit to benefit payments which entrenches children in poverty while inexplicably accepting expensive personal gifts of designer suits and glasses costing more than most of those people can grasp. This is entirely undeserving of holding the title of Labour Prime Minister. I'd say any Prime Minister, actually. Forcing a vote to make many older people iller and colder while you and your favourite colleagues enjoy free family trips to events most people would have to save hard for. Why are you not showing even the slightest bit of embarrassment or remorse? That's a very good question. I think that's one of the things that struck me, not just in terms of that. But generally, there seems to be a, a lack of emotional engagement, but specifically here, embarrassment, shame, sadness, remorse, doesn't seem to be there. Sometimes they're as good as their promise, meaning that some people in an interview situation, well, they are, they are who they said they were. They have integrity. They do what they said that they would do. But many turn out to be not just confident, but arrogant and entitled. Instead of being bold, they're merely impulsive. They lack empathy and exploit others without compunction. They ignore expert advice and treat those who differ with contempt and hostility. Above all, they demand personal loyalty. They are, in short, raging narcissists. Back to Rosie Duffield's letter. You have never regularly engaged with your own backbench MPs, many of whom have been in Parliament far longer than you, and some of whom served in the previous Labour government. You have chosen neither to seek our individual political opinions, nor learn about our constituency experiences, nor our specific or collective areas of political knowledge. We clearly have nothing you deem to be of value. Now, I appreciate that this is one letter from one individual who's obviously upset, annoyed, maybe even angry. And yet, even if 50%, 20% of 
of what she's writing is true, it is disturbing. I'm not saying that Sir Keir Starmer is a narcissist or indeed has narcissistic personality disorder. What I am saying is that when you look at the behaviours of some narcissistic leaders, the grandiose type, and then you look at some of the concerns that someone who's resigned from Sir Keir Starmer's party has and had, there's quite an overlap. Behaving in the way that he's behaving is alienating so many people. And I just don't think it is leadership at all. It's not leadership as I was understand it. What we're seeing here is someone who really needs to change and change quite quickly because although Sakir may not be a narcissist, narcissists do damage in organisations as leaders. And those organisations can include political parties and of course they can encompass countries. They do real damage. And therefore, he doesn't have to be a narcissist to cause damage when his behaviours seem to be so closely aligned to the behaviours that a narcissistic leader would demonstrate. 